All right. <laughs> um, our speaker today is Mary Jo Forbord. And uh, Mary Jo grew up in Swift County, Minnesota, and works as the Healthy Eating Coordinator at the University of Minnesota Morris. She graduated from the University of Minnesota and has worked in various aspects of food and farming systems for nearly 40 years. Mary Jo served as Executive Director of the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota from 2003 to, to, to 2009 and as chair of the Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Practice Group of the American Dietetic Association, receiving the Excellence in Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Leadership Award in 2015. Mary Jo and her husband Laverne graze cattle and grow fruits and vegetables on their organic farm in the Upper Minnesota River watershed. Mary Jo and Laverne are fifth generation Minnesota farmers working to assure that next generations enjoy and benefit from living soil, clean water, and delicious food. They are launching Joran's Orchard Cooperative at Prairie Horizons Farm so that more people can participate in building healthy food and farming systems. Mary Jo says, if we do our best to sustain the splendid diversity of life teeming in the tall grass prairie Humankind can be sustained in this place we call home for generations to come. It is my pleasure to invite Mary Jo Forbord to the stage to deliver her keynote address, The Food in This Place. Good morning, everyone. It is an amazing feeling to be here. Uh, I am so grateful for this place filled with love and peace and hospitality. I have been treated so royally since I arrived last night, had such great conversations. And uh, when I think about where we are in this moment in time and our discussions of food, the solutions are indeed in the connections. And there are connections here. There are connections that you have outside of this room. This is truly what gives me hope. So I thank you very much. I'm very grateful for being here. Uh, a little uh, totally odd, I should say, that, um, that I am, have been asked to be your keynote. So I will do my best to uh, tell my story and give you my thoughts and um, recognizing that the wisdom is here in this room. So where do I come from? I think I come from the upper Minnesota River Valley. It's a place where I feel so connected to the land and to the farm and to all of the living things there. But as I think about where I really came from and my ancestors, we go across the big pond, about across the Atlantic, uh, one branch of my family, the patriarchal side, and farming tends to be one of these patriarchal systems, uh, are kind of perched on the mountains in Norway. You know, you kind of head up the goat path to the edge of the glacier when the goat path stops. That's where the Hillerins came from, and that was my, my maiden name. So when we had a chance to go there in 2005, a lot of things became a lot more clear to me as the people there would tell me about those days in the 1860s and how tough it was in Norway that there were big families and not enough land and people were starving. And so then the farm policy that was crafted across the pond, across the Atlantic, called the Homestead Act, sent out a beacon to those peasants who were starving, whose landmass was too small for the families of 10 and 13 children to make a living. So my ancestors made some hard decisions to set sail and to say, we're never going to see the rest of our family again. You think about how wrenching those decisions were. And to come to a place and find that it's unbelievable. There's soil here, and we deep, rich, black soil, you know, th that we could only dream about in Norway. And we can have it for just being here, or even a tree claim. The Homestead Act made those provisions so that settlers could 
could come uh, and, and set up communities. So my family uh, settled on the shores of what was then known as Buffalo Lake, which I found out later was Lake Shakopee for the Shakopee chief, um, and began their farming career, first to feed themselves. That was all that they really wanted to do, but the railroads were the avenues to feed the cities and to feed the mill city. And so it was a, a, an arrangement where the railroads were laid, but there's no reason to lay a railroad if there are not also things coming back on that railroad. So the people would go this way, the goods and the food would go um, this way, and that is how um, this area of our, our country was settled. But for a long time, I was missing a lot of really important history. We really thought we were almost the first people of this land. <laughs> history began with the railroads. If you look at the, the web pages of some small towns, you will still think that, that life began with the railroads. Well, it's true that a different culture uh, with a different set of values began about that time. But it is really through you know, the, the prairies, the connection with the land, that we are connected to the first people of this place who are still here, but didn't have the same ownership of the land. In fact, ownership was really a very uh, not, not you, how could you own the land? How could you own other life? It was a reverence for the connections of all of that life that was indeed teeming in the tall grass prairie. And under that tall grass prairie was built the most wonderful living soils, just you know, thousands of years of, of composted, decayed, and uh, you know, after the glaciers came, building up those soils. And they were very, very productive for food. It doesn't mean that life was easy in the 1870s or 1880s. And those are some of the historical tough times that we have all heard about. But I wonder how much we've heard about um, the tough times you know, around 1860 and before. And what is the use, what is the utility of thinking and knowing about those times? Actually, quite a lot. Now, our present farming uh, you know, has still continued to turn over the prairie and in some times you know, treat that prairie a little bit like a big black petri dish and not so that everything has to be added to it in order to uh, produce a certain crop. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those things because you've given me a great outline to go from when you, in your 12th year here, have discussed among yourselves about what you really want to hear about, what you want to zero on in on. So we'll be talking about some of the present day uh, issues with, with agriculture. But I want to spend a little bit more time about uh, what we can learn from the pe first people who are still here. Number one, the connection of us all and the connection of all living things, the importance of those living things to, to all of us today, and their relevance into the future. Where I work now is the University of Minnesota Morris, and we have a tagline. It's the, the sus your sustainable and renewable education. And I would, I would like you to think about that the first people have everything to do with our future vision of sustainability. They use the plants and medicine of the tall grass prairie. They valued and revered the wildlife procuring their sustenance from the land, not just for a brief period of time, but over 10,000 years. And so when we look at the history of my people and perhaps uh, most of your people on the land, it's a very brief moment when we think about five generations and we think about what has happened in that time from people feeding themselves to then feeding the cities and then feeding the nation and now our claim to feed the world. It's a tall order for a place in the Midwest of a small uh, continent, uh, you know, known as Turtle Island to first people, to say or even believe that we can feed the world 
and to leapfrog over the feeding of our communities and the feeding of our children well. I think that is the issue of, of our today's discussion is how can we feed our children well into the future. I think that is something that can truly unite us and maybe take us away from our own individual interests and stake in the food system toward a binding vision for the future, which I think that we all would like to see. So I invite you as I talk about some of the issues and problems in agriculture to reflect on the first people of this place, who I would also uh, quickly add are not in the past. They still live am among us. Uh, they do not have land holdings as much as the second people of the land, which would be um, the people that I descended from. And if we could think about, at the end of our discussion today, what make it, might a third people of the land look like? And I'm not thinking of a third people, of a certain group of people, but how could we craft an agriculture that really is human scale, that is inclusive, that doesn't lead us, leave us stopped on a place where there's much food insecurity and there's much that is eaten that I have to question, is that really food? Is it really nourishment? And my career in dietetics has all been about the 300,000 products that have been invented that all have nutrition labels that we have to study and you know we it's it's directed to a place that it becomes very very difficult for people to find sustenance food that truly nourishes in situations that are truly nourishing because it's not just the food in itself and I, I know all of you know know that it's the community around that food and that's what I think we have a chance to start to reconnect and and re rethink and redo so let me start with um, the you you had asked the, your keynote speaker first of all to reflect on food and the broad scope of disconnect from the following levels you're talking about agricultural economic cultural personal and nutritional. So I'm going to start with where we as a culture and society usually start, and that's personal and nutritional. I work in the Department of Wellness on campus, and wellness has become very circumscribed and sort of individual about how can I choose the best foods and uh, how can I get for myself those foods? And how can I get some time at the gym and balance my life out? And it's a very solo, solitary course. We're trying to change that by you know, looking at other cultures' views of wellness, which is more inclusive and holistic and community-minded. But that personal and nutritional level has brought us to a place where there's a million different products that you could use to give yourself that competitive edge and that the nutrients, you know, if you tweak them just enough and eat them just at the right times and in, you know, all of these things, then you're going to get a personal advantage, okay? To me, that seems uh, a little, um, you know, like a very long way to making a difference. And this was further fortified by my recent attendance at the 100th Annual Dietetics and Nutrition Conference in Chicago. Very interesting to go there. I just returned a, a couple of weeks ago. But you go into the expo hall, and it's mind-boggling what you can do with a granola bar. <laughs> How much of what kind of protein can you stuff in that package? And dietitians were sampling them with an abandon. To me, they all tasted like the package. <laughs> Obviously, I think that is uh, the wrong route. Along with some of the sessions that were there, the sessions were really um, eye-opening in that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about seeds and GMOs. You know, you had a conference, was that last year, on seeds? 
I wish I would have been here. I'm going to tune in more sharply. But everything we're talking about today has to do with, you know, all of your past conferences, the seeds and the, the soil. Uh, but seeds were especially hot topic. And, and let me tell you, dietitians are not all that connected to agriculture. Uh, in my education, I was educated away from agriculture toward a sort of a clinical, uh, you know, medical version where uh, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money in the last weeks of people's lives. When disease was full blown, when the power of nutrition could no longer make a difference, and that was a time when it was it was medicalized and the power of nutrition was sort of bled out of the system. And so then the 1980s came and you all remember, some of you remember uh, the farm crisis, you know, the one that's become chronic, like since the 1800s, uh, where we're losing farmers, you know, and we talk about the 99% and 1% and we don't know if we're talking about poverty levels or the ratio between consumers to farmers. But in the 1980s, there were groups of people and farmers, some of whom are in this room, that said, hey, wait a minute. This get, get big or get out philosophy, this just doesn't sound like a way to make strong, healthy communities and to keep people on the land. So I'm very proud to be from an area where this movement surfaced, where there's got to be another way. LSP, Sustainable Farming Association, uh, you know, organic farmers, people who said, wait, there's more to this than just getting bigger and specializing. And so during that time, uh, I was in the Dietetic Association and um, president of the Minnesota State Dietetic Association, and my president-elect said she's from Chicago. You know, her the only field she knew about was Wrigley Field. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she said to me, shouldn't dietitians be concerned about this? You know, and it was like one of those moments when Kennedy died. I was on the phone. I remember it was the old dial phone on my farm. You know, it was linked with this squiggly cord that nobody uses anymore, you know, except in plays or something like that. Yeah. And it was like the two hemispheres of my brain reconnected. My farm, the growing up, the love of the land, the connection that I felt there had been diverted or lost in the white lab coats and the nutrition and the concentrating on the nutrients at the sacrifice of the bigger picture. And I began to try to reconnect for other dietitians as well what had fallen away, the two halves of the whole, the nutrition and the agriculture. And that was the time of the Alar scare in apples, um, you know, and it's, it hit the news, Alar on our apples, our sacred apples that, you know, are significant and a symbol of health. And what sprayed with Alar? So I began to dig in to the toxins and the chemicals that were found in our food. And um, it was not received very well. You know, it's like that's out of our scope of practice. Well, that's a convenient way to move it off of our table, but aren't you moving it onto someone else's plate? Well, unfortunately, that Committee on Agriculture and the Dietetic Association lasted but two years. And so then it, it ended with just simply saying, what does nutrition have to do with agriculture? <laughs> okay, yeah, and, and you know, when, when I say the solutions are in the connection, some of the problems are in the disconnect. And that is, that is certainly one of them. So during that time, my husband and I were getting into farming. I had grown up on a, a farm that used to be diversified like most farms, but because we farmed the uh, flat, black, drained wetlands of Swift County, we tended to specialize a little bit before uh, where my husband grew up, which was north of, of Benson. So if you know that topography at all, it's like drained wetlands through Swift County, and then as you go up into Pope County, the land starts to undulate a little bit. And uh, I can remember driving up there as a child and my dad saying, yep, they're burning up in the hills again. 
he didn't think too much of that terrain. You know, it wasn't that flat black farmland that could be drained. And you know, we were one of the first farms to, to drain into the Shakopee Creek. And the whole time I grew up next to that Shakopee Creek, I had no idea where that name came from. But of course, it was from the Dakota chief, uh, Shakopee, who had summer camps in that area and whose people sustained themselves on those lands. So in my husband's uh, family, you know, they specialized in dairy. And so we, we decided that that was the route that we would go into, is into dairy. And I was becoming quite um, disillusioned by health care. Number one, nutrition wasn't treated as anything that was relevant or important to people's lives. It was just sort of an afterthought. Uh, worked with surgeons that if you couldn't fix it with a knife, you couldn't fix it. You know, just sort of uh, a moving to the side. And I think we're still there. I think we, we have not rediscovered the power of nutrition to this day. It, but it awaits us. You know, and that's what's hopeful is that rediscovering of the power of clinic of nutrition, not just for our own bodies, but for the food and connections that that can create. So as we go along with, um, you know, the my husband's family and his um, specialization uh, into dairy, we start to realize that dairy is not going to be saved from industrialization. That my family farm that was all about crops that needed to get larger was now going to be applied to dairy. And um, the experts who came to us said, well, do you want 500, 600, 700, or 1,000 cows? <laughs> yes. And this was, you know, 1990s. And as we thought about this, as we thought about what we really loved and where our skills were, my husband is, uh, is absolutely astounding when it comes to the bovine. I mean, he grew up with them. He's been with them for now. 60 years, and when I started, when I was disillusioned with healthcare and started working on the family dairy, he taught me a hundred different things you could, could notice about a cow just walking up to her. You know, and I grew up on a farm and I was so clueless about this, this animal-human bond. And he'd say, oh, Dawn is not feeling well today. I go, oh, she looks okay to me, how do you know? Well, look at her eyes. Okay, looking. See how they're sunk in? Maybe. <laughs> uh, see how the hair is tipped on her back, you know? All of these different things of being in tune with that other living thing. And so through that four years that I was full-time on the dairy, that's when the food system came down on top of us as not making a whole lot of sense. Number one, we're working very hard below the cost of production. Day and night, how many of you have history on dairy farms? Okay, my highest respects. You know what hard work is, you know what relentless work is. Every 12 hours you are on duty. Your whole social life, if you have one, is arranged around that. Meetings never start before 8 p.m. at night, and these were the things that were you know, just very common in the, in the community. Um, but that wasn't enough. Uh, the milk would go to Florida. So we've got a 85, 90% product uh, water, water product. And it's going in a tanker from our little, little farm, you know, in rural Starbuck, Minnesota, uh, to Florida. And we're doing that at a loss. And so in the time we were in dairying, uh, we actually lost half of the dairy farmers in our state. And since that time, I'm sure there's been even more attrition as we seem to swing toward a need to separate animals from plants, which is not exactly a genius move, I would say, <laughs> for humans to do. Uh, it creates a lot more work for ourselves. It creates a lot more use of resources. And I really wonder if we're getting to whatever bottom line it is we're, we're wanting to get to. Because in order to, to have those animals living in such close proximity, we have to bring in things like antibiotics. Uh, we have to uh, use a lot of the hormones that will cycle these animals so it's more convenient for us to have them um, enter the milking stream at a certain time. 
And that is really what I saw when I, when I was milking full time on the farm because our farm was pretty low input. It was sustainable maybe without knowing it. But the times change. And if there is no differentiation between milk that is grass fed and organic and there's no market for that, then all you have is a commodity. And you're subject to things like um, the Monsanto uh, displays at the Dietetic Association in, in Chicago, which say, milk is milk and beef is beef. <laughs> you don't buy that? I don't either. I know that it's not. We have to start looking at the quality differences in food. And those quality differences are derived from the agricultural systems that those foods are derived from. And in fact, more and more research is pointing toward that living soil. And understanding what we thought was a black petri dish is really a living, breathing mass of life that we are just beginning to understand. What I don't understand is why we are so bent on destroying something that we don't understand. You know, could we give ourselves a, a little time and not be quite as arrogant to say, we actually don't know a lot about our soils, but before we destroy them and all of the insects and pollinators and animals and plants that may reside here that we've labeled weed, 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 maybe there's medicinal qualities. Maybe those first people who derived their medicines from those plants were onto something after 10,000 years. That takes a humbleness on our part to say, hey, we're not in charge here entirely. Our intellect, uh, as we look over the vast lands and how we want those lands to produce for us, we might have a few things that aren't quite right. We seem to be in a pattern right now with our agriculture where we're coming up with a, against a lot of problems. And if we have time to reflect or look at where, how those problems arise, we may get some clues to maybe where those problems are of our own making. And so it seems that, let's take for instance, uh, soybean aphid. Soybean aphid, huge problem for soybean producers. Huge problem for us as a people as the planes start to drone in the mornings to kill those soybean aphids. Now, if we had a product that would kill just soybean aphids, I still don't know if we'd get it all right because soybean aphids is no problem where soybeans came from because soybeans are part of a huge biological mix and soybean aphids over in Asia get eaten up by all sorts of other things, sort of that Jurassic Park of, of insects that are, are there. But you know, if we have wall-to-wall -wall soybeans, nature's gonna come in with wall-to-wall -wall soybean aphids. So then what's our move? We come in with spray, all right, from airplanes. Very, very non-precise, non-targeted. And that isn't a spray that says, okay, you're a soybean aphid, you go. You're a soybean aphid, you go. No, it's the beneficial insects that organic farmers depend on, the pollinators of the food supply, and that spray has effects even beyond. You know, it, we're, we're fooling ourselves to believe that we can kill off everything else and somehow we can survive. So I think a lot of our solutions in, um, you know, really deriving our personal health has to come from looking at the system. And how is it that you can create life and vitality if you're assignment as a farmer has become to kill everything but what the multinational corporations own. We are in an unfortunate but fortunate situation on our farm in that it is, we've decided that, you know, the first people had a pretty good idea of trying to use the upside of the prairie. So we've restored uh, much of our row crops. In fact, uh, we, we till very little, just only for our garden crops now. So that's what really led us into this, is, is the wonder of the tall grass prairie and saying, 
You know, that plant is really too beautiful to be a weed. I wonder what use it had because we had no education on the tall grass prairie. In school, I thought of a prairie as a flat monoculture of brome grass, because I didn't really know anything but brome grass. And why wouldn't you plow that up? It was just wasteland. You know, that term wasteland came into my vocabulary very, very early. And so that's what I thought of the tall grass prairie. But in the hill country north of Benson, there were hills and rocks that protected these a vast, beautiful array of plants that would bloom all season long. And it was really through the prairie that my husband and I became connected, not only with our own farm, but with the people who came before us. So on that fence line is the prairie turned up again. You know, not, you can't really do that. It takes hundreds of years, but we can sort of use what remnant native prairie we have as the gold standard and try to do our best to use native local ecotypes and to put in around that prairie um, plants that will protect it. And then our cattle mimic the movement of the bison. So we're actually taking a lot of cues from the first people. Of course, we can't do it um, exactly how they did, but we try to use fire, uh, use those large ruminants on the prairie. And that biological diversity of life is just a wonder to behold. And then on the fence line, the land that used to be owned by my husband's brother was sold three years ago to a farmer from 50 miles away. And increasingly, neighborhoods are not neighborhoods. There's been a depopulation. There's been an aging of the population. There's also the term food deserts, uh, not only the term, but in Western Minnesota, uh, the people who feed the world are doing it from a food desert. And if that doesn't give us pause to say that we ought to rethink uh, what we're doing in the upper Minnesota River Valley. I'm going to confine my remarks to that area because I, I feel it's, you know, I don't know as much about the Chesapeake Bay or, you know, other places. And we have to treat our agriculture in ways that aren't black petri dish in scope because our lands are so vastly different. And in here in Minnesota with the three microbiomes, what a huge array of just life and, and uh, diversity, microclimates. Think of the diversity we could be growing if we can find a path forward to what I'm going to call the third people of this place. And I hope you're still trying to imagine what that could be, like the third people. You know, as we look toward this coming time when we're hearing these words from the 1980s again, foreclosures, disappearance of more farms. At the same time, there's pockets of hope. And you hear about the East and West Coast, and you hear about Minneapolis-St. Paul, and you hear about CSAs. These things are definitely pockets of hope. But my hope also is that the Upper Minnesota River Valley has not been designated as a sacrificial area for corn and for beans because that means that those crops are produced as much and as cheap and as fast as we can at the expense of our people, our communities, our water, and our soil. We live in a beautiful place with rich history that we need to learn from, to dig into, and to connect around. And I hope that that will all be our future. But right now, we struggle with, with the dissolving of communities uh, where farmers come from 50 miles away. And they're there for one purpose, and that's to do the job quickly so they can get on to other thousands of acres in other counties. And in my lifetime, I've seen the narrowing of the diversity of crops to just these two. And it's been written into our farm bill and our farm policy. This, and those farm policies are powerful. It's the reason I'm here. You know, through the Homestead Act and all of, and somehow 
uh, farming, swimming upstream. Many of you have farm background. How many uh, can trace your, your heritage back to the farm? Wow, look around, okay. All right, and today, are you farming? Okay, all right, good. Okay, we wanna double this number by next year. <laughs> okay, let's do it right here, right now. <laughs> So the vision that others have, kind of the larger players in this, is really more of the same, only larger. People are in the way. I don't think I dream this. I was told this. I was told this. Terry Vanderpool might have been in the room when I was told this by Colin Peterson, our representative. Um, and you know, she, he's been a big proponent of ethanol. And it was back in, before the 2008 Farm Bill. And so I was trying to use a little bit of a strategy about, well, okay, we have incentives for eth ethanol. Could we use those incentives, like that same pattern for local foods and start to eat the food that we grow here? And he started shaking his head early on and he goes, they hate people like you in Washington. Let me tell you how the farm bill is written. It's written by agribusiness. They have lobbyists. They're well paid, they're motivated, they're knowledgeable. They write the farm bill. Oh, he said they were crawling the walls of Congress, which felt kind of creepy. Um, they write the farm bill. And when they're done, they put on a few plums to placate you. Most people agree that that's how the farm bill is written. And it is through our apathy, through our just putting aside the value of food that has allowed that to happen. And it's not going to be easy to get it back, to get it back into our communities so that food is sustaining for everyone. In the 80s, in the farm crisis, was also the advent of food pantries. Uh, maybe not the very beginning, but I remember serving on the first board uh, in the in Wilmer area food shelf. My first job was in Wilmer at the, the medical center there. And so the food shelf, and definitely the feeling was all about, okay, this is gonna last a couple of years, but we really have to get people through some rough times here. So uh, we had the Wilmer area food shelf, and. You know, as if any of you were involved in those early days, it's like, does this person really deserve to have this food? You know, just this, and it's still kind of there in some places. Well, at this dietetic conference of the 100th anniversary of the formation of uh, American Dietetic Association, there were uh, presentations about food pantries. And one of the most remarkable um, that I heard was the, the Denver food pantry. And you know, there's 40,000 food pantries across the United States now. And so the Denver food pantry um, you know, had gone from that place of, okay, now who are you and do you meet all of these guidelines and then we'll go into the back room and we'll figure out what it is that you can have and then we'll push it out through some doors to you. you know, and that's kind of the setup of the, the food shelves of the past. Well, Denver being Denver, they were able to build this grand new building and now they're getting donations from Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, and uh, so they're doing pretty well, but they've also introduced cooking classes and ways to really uh, get people familiar with the food. So they've got the fresh food, and by the looks of things, you could hardly determine that you were anywhere else than in a supermarket because they had dropped the requirements that, okay, two cans of this and four cans of this, and you know all of those calculations, and let people go in and select. Then they started putting in a few policies about, are we here just to serve calories or are we here to serve nutritious foods? You know, every food pantry kind of comes to that fork in the road. And so they decided they were about nutrition, less than 10 grams of sugar per serving, rules like that. But then it turns out that the staff was taking all of those luscious thick frosting cupcakes up to the break room and so they were not on the <laughs> less, <laughs> less than 10 grams of sugar program. And that's when this policy really hit rough waters. 
okay, when the staff said, oh, you mean we can't have foods that are less than 10? Okay, that's a different deal. Uh, but the, the staff now has become accustomed to that. And one of the things that I wanted to question about, because they were trying to think in this full circle, as we all should when we're thinking about food, um, because to think linearly kind of gets us to the place that we're at. But so when they got in all of these products, uh, that were more than 10 grams of sugar per serving, then they had to do this little dance with the donors, right? Because these donors, yeah, you don't want to turn off a big donor. So they were actually taking those products and giving them to a pig farmer. <laughs> okay, end of story or not? No, but they were thinking it was end of story, like they had completed the cycle and they were feeling good about that. So I'm trying to, I want to, I want to follow that cycle. You know, what do they do with individually wrapped granola bars and single, you know, plastics from bakeries? And that ought to be some really sweet pork. But what do you do with all that waste that comes with it? So there's a whole nother system there that we're sort of starting to, to bump into, but really have to complete that so that the nutrients that are would otherwise be wasted are better utilized within the system or more better yet travel upstream and take a look at what we're producing and how it is that we can utilize it at at that level instead of overproduce you know because that wastes a ton of resources so we still have work to do i think i saw one of the best examples and then they had actually done research to say well how does that work if we pick out the products for them don't we get a better you know nutritional balance in their diet than if they the, the clients pick them out what do you think no actually their every nutrition component went up so I think it proved to them that trusting people and including people as best you can in a community as opposed to us versus them in food, um, you know, and it, it gave me inspiration to come back home and say, we need to update our food pantry system from the 1980s. And maybe it can be that focus of, of where people learn about food and good food and feel included in the community because I, I think we're not really... Um, probably there yet at all. So a lot of the things that I have been talking about, um, you know, we started with the nutritional and personal level and then started to look at how this feeds in from our agricultural and economic system. And the economic system is, is huge. Uh, when I was working with sustainable farming, which taught me all of the things that farmers were doing, you know, I always view sustainable farmers and organic farmers as, as like the, the, the fox who avoided the trap. You know, I think about these foxes, you make more, more tracks than usual to avoid being caught in a snare. That's the sustainable and organic farmer, I think. And then you put that with a love of place and a knowledge of place, and there you've got the foundation for a healthy food system. Then you start to think about, okay, what about this 99, 1%? I think there's still 2% two, 2 farmers, but the way we're going, it's going to be 1% unless we change course. Remember, um, you know, the, the vision that is not so much proclaimed, but is underlying everything we do, is more of the same, only larger. So when we're talking about that third people, you know, are there going to be people or are people in the way in the upper Minnesota River Valley? Are we going to have an agriculture that has the right of way for sprays or are we going to have an agriculture that is inclusive and invites people in? Because I would, I would say that we need to do more than open our wallets for our food. Sometimes we don't want to even open our wallet even very much for our food. I think we need more participants in our food system. In some way, in some form, we can't all be producers, we don't all have access to land, but I can tell you that that production aspect is shaking and quaking right now. Um, we're finding that, you know, the corn and beans, they haven't been profitable for three years, perhaps. And you know about, you know, what age do farmers retire? What, what you know, when, when do farmers retire? All of those that you have farm background? 75, 80? 
never, okay? I go with never. Um, <laughs> so what you hear is the 80-year-old parents or parent is still involved with the 55, 60 or so year old brothers. And here comes um, the young daughter or son, college graduate, wants to get back into the farm. No, there's no, no room. Not only is there no room economically, there's no room psychologically or young people have a way of looking at situations and saying, oh, but I'll still do it this way or I can get through this way. So I'm hearing a lot about the next generation of conventional farm families who want to grow fruit trees, have goats, make a go at um, you know, sheep, uh, have a CSA, and the parents are going, no, no, you don't understand. This is modern agriculture. You know, this is, this is, that's something that should have died out in the 50s. We're talking serious stuff here now, and we're talking between the older generation and the middle generation, and we're, we're trying to make it work, and when we figure it out, we'll let you know what you can do. But right now, go get a job somewhere else, because this is way too hard. Now, that's been the way that things have been going in farm country for a long time. And I think for this, especially for the last 25 years, you know, I, my, the only thing I collect is your books of agriculture because I think it's fascinating to see how this farm policy is nothing new. It's really been unfolding since before the gasoline engine. You know, a surplus of people on the land, let's get them into um, productive um, jobs. So 25 years ago, your books of agriculture stopped being produced. That coincided with the advent of, of GMOs. And uh, not only did the drumbeat of feed the nine billion by 2050 come back again, because we had heard that in the 1980s and then it sort of dipped and, oh, that sounds like a good slogan. Let's, let's use that. Um, but with that, that sort of coming back to um, the nine billion by 2050, there also became a portrayal in conventional farm magazines, but because just because we switched organic doesn't mean the, the conventional farm magazines don't still pile up because they're kind of, uh, you know, powered by their their advertising. And I started noticing how consumers were por portrayed in conventional farm magazines. They were portrayed as clueless, not caring, cheap distant from the farm, and you had to feed them anyway. <laughs> so that, and farmers are good people. You know, I'm descended from these people, and I don't want to fall into the trap of blaming farmers for what's going on in farm country, because I think we're all implicated by that and the, the policies that are, are active and in place and our, our willingness to be on the other side of the fence as a consumer, and we're talking about CSAs and these other forms of agriculture that are not commodity agriculture, expecting farmers to do all of the distribution and all of the processing and get it to us at a price that you know is matching or below uh, what uh, a larger system can give. So that portrayal for the last 25 years, that disconnect between producers and consumers has built a pretty big wall. You know, another way we might term that, you know, we heard a lot about globalization. Okay, I, I think we've done a 25 year run at that, and how's it working for us? How's it working for the upper Minnesota River Valley? The further you go west, the more depopulated I, I believe things are, you know, Morris is, I feel fortunate to be working in Morris. It's a diverse place. It's a place of, of, of thought and um, perhaps uh, like here, uh, one of those bright spots in the, the watershed. The graduating class, um, Benson High School is now below 60. When I graduated, it was 180. So we're looking at like a two thirds, and that's not unusual at all. Uh, we're looking at rural poverty. We're looking at people who are perhaps hungry, perhaps who need food assistance, but are too proud 
So I think some of the um, statistics are lower than they probably are in actuality. So we have communities that are really hurting. At the same time, you know, I know you talked about water at a previous conference, but we can't talk about food without water. We can't talk about agricultural systems without water. Because therein uh, lies the effluent of our production systems. I remember when genetically modified um, corn and beans first came to our part of the country, um, there was a volunteer soybean plant in the corn. How many of you have cut weeds in the soybeans? Yeah, back in the days when they couldn't be touched by a herbicide. And I went, wow, soybeans volunteering in corn, that's a major, major shift. But of course, they were Roundup ready, Roundup resistant. So already, the macro changes were on the landscape. And then in the hills north of Benson, where we farm, um, found out that weeds actually served a pretty good purpose in the rows. They prevented erosion. So then, coupled with these three-inch rainfalls that we tend to have, long periods of dry, followed by rainfall events, as they're now called, you could stand in the gullies, shoulder high. The soil needs to be held by roots. And so on our farm on this fence line, where you know in dairying you have alfalfa as part of the rotation and now we're completely perennialized, you come to a fence line and it drops six feet. There's tillage on the other side. That six feet of soil is sloughing toward the lake. And it's a very narrow field, one that's farmed by someone from only 40 miles away, not 30 miles away. And the airplane sprays six passes. You know, they had soybeans this year. So six passes on a quiet summer night. Do you hear those planes here? Droning on the horizon. I think we need more eyes and ears on the land. I do think our food, our connection, we need, we need that. Because if there were people there to see that those sprays hung in the air for up to a minute and then filtered down into the lake, and then that lake drains into the Chippewa, and then that drains into the Minnesota, comes to Mankato goes to New Orleans. And that hypoxia zone, that's connected too. So these connections, I think, to first see that we are connected, even though you know, in our minds we may be disconnected, how is it that we can really think less about our differences and more about our similarities and our ability to build new community? My ancestors um, settled in an area that was uh, Irish and German and Norwegian. And so they adopted the English language pretty early, you know, Lutheran background. And, um, but where I moved to, where my husband grew up, they knew who the Catholic family was in the phone book <laughs> in Starbuck. You know, when there was a phone, oh, they're yeah, the pharmacist, Catholic family. Yes, and so it was this whole Norwegian community. I'm half German. It's like, mm, okay, she's half German, but I guess we'll go with it. Um, but if you can't find anything to argue about, I guess you argue about your Norwegian dialect. And so that was a huge area of discussion. And, you know, they had Norwegian language uh, services until 1953. And so you think... Is there anywhere on earth where things could be more homogeneous? <laughs> Not to them. Yeah, there's definite differences here. And um, forgetting that we're all pretty much refugees. We certainly were. Yeah, and now we call this home. How privileged is that? You know, to own the land. The older I get, the more I see that that ownership is... It can be um, 
detrimental. It can, it can lead us to say, because I own this, I can do anything to it. But what we do to it affects others, other, other living things, other people, other, you know, as far away as beyond the Gulf of Mexico and the hypoxia zone. So monoculture, to me, you know, there's all kinds of discussion, and there was certainly at the Dietetic Association Convention. I was disappointed that, uh, you know, a lot of the leading scientists were there to say, look, people are clueless about GMOs. They've been eating them for 25 years, and dietitians, you really have to put them at ease because this is how we need to feed the world. That was the dominant message. And I think it's because there's so push, much pushback on GMOs. And I won't claim to know all about the science, but I will claim to know that it is unprecedented in human history for seeds to be patented and seeds to be owned. I don't think that's a good trend, especially when the big six multinational corporations are now becoming the big three multinational corporate you guys are studying this i love this yes you know you know what's up and so where is help coming from washington no. <laughs> here's where help is coming from i it's another thing that that i do know i also know what the application of gmos widespread on our landscape has done. And I'm suspect for what else we're going to find out. And we're starting to find that out. It has favored these patented species over everything else. It has made my ancestors into, you know, not growing food, but killing everything else above and below the soil. Because when you look at a field that is a genetically modified crop, a clean field, as my dad used to call them, and I think you still hear this terminology, is one that is monoculture. It doesn't grow anything else. The weeds will try to come back. Yes, resistant weeds, resistance pests. Nature is powerful, much more powerful than us. I hope we get that through our heads pretty soon. Because we're going to be the losers if we don't. And so. When I, my earliest training in nutrition was all about the diversity of the plate. We need a diversity of healthful foods, not very highly processed. So have we been able to improve upon that with our umpteen different flavors and protein contents of granola bars? No, we haven't. At the point of harvest from healthy soil is the maximum nutrition that you will find for food. So eating more fruits and vegetables, having that be half of your plate, that's a, a well-known tenet of nutrition. Where we need to dig further is how are those fruits and vegetables raised? How, are, how is the meat raised? All of those things make a big difference. When we transitioned out of conventional production, um, you know, I remember going with my husband, you know, I thought that, you know, the patriarchal system of agriculture needed a few women. Well, they didn't really think so, but I went to the, um, the sessions anyway, and it was usually a chemical dealer talking about how much of this stuff you're going to put on and what stack, uh, you know, genetic um, material you're going to use. And then they would have, like, instant potatoes and, um, they, you know, that canned corn that's so over mature. You know, it's just like, yeah, that was always there. And then, like, um, the, the boxed gravy and, um, yeah, so that was kind of standard. You know, the, veg the vegetables were just that over-mature corn. And then the whitest, fluffiest rolls, they were, like, floating away. And some su sort of suspect uh, fat substance that you would put on. Maybe it was that stuff my mother was convinced uh, should replace butter, you know, the white... Uh, trans fat stuff where you stirred in the orange coloring. Oh, some of you remember that? <laughs> wow, you're as old as I am. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's where I came from. And then I went to the Moses Conference. Okay, who's been to the Moses Conference? Yeah, okay, largest gathering of organic farmers in the nation. There were young people there. Not everybody had gray hair. There were babies there. 
there was a very positive attitude in the air. There was hope. There was excitement. But what I really was struck by was how good the food was. Wow. Yeah, real food. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we're so happy that people remember what that real food is because we do need to bring that forward. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about about the, the loss of reverence and ritual of eating and mealtime, which, you know, when you think about the first people of this place, most of their lives were centered around making sure that their community could eat during the cold winter and putting up food and things like that. So, you know, our culture, um, the second people of this place, had that too. They had to feed themselves year round. But as we got into refrigeration and those skills were devalued and it was purposely devalued. My, my grandmother's cookbooks in the 1960s, uh, one from Pillsbury, I remember reading, okay women, you can have a real life too. You can be a self-actualized person. You never have to peel another, another potato unless you want to because we've got it in the box for you. So it was that devaluing of the family mealtime. And, you know, uh, as our discussion this morning, you know, it was good that, um, you know, the, the roles, it, women were, you know, probably too stereotyped into that, that role of food production. You know, these days, men take part as much as anyone cooks anyway. But that devaluing all, of all of those skills Fortunately, I grew up in a household where they canned, and I, so I, I learned all of those skills. And so then I was amazed to run into uh, young women who had grown up on a farm who wanted to learn how to can. And I'm continually amazed that college students now are really geared into this. The college generation now is the most hopeful that I've seen. Um, four of my best students that I've worked with, they're not from this area. They're not from the upper Minnesota River Valley but they want to stay here. And I wake up at night and think, did I dream that? <laughs> Young people want to stay here, and it just gets me so motivated that how are we going to find places for these, these young people? Because we've been so busy thinking it can't be possible. Those conventional farm families who are saying, no, you just don't get it. Here's modern farming. If we could say, just open your hearts, open your ears, to your next generation and give them an acre or two or whatever it takes to just explore their dreams. That's the hardest step. The kids at college that don't come from farm families, they just launch into it headlong. And we even have stories of, you know, 25 years ago of that happening in our community where, you know, someone who's our Mike Jacobs and Easy Bean Farm, you know, one of the most famous CSAs that we're so proud of, often says that his unfair advantage was that he was never instructed what he couldn't do. <laughs> and I do think we have to think about our mindset and how tightened down we've gotten in marching toward specialization and how things have to be done and the size of the farms and separating the plants from the animals and return to some of that wisdom from an earlier time, perhaps in our ancestral tree, perhaps uh, first generations. And when it comes to mealtimes and sharing that with the community, it took the sociologists for us to point back and say, you know that family meal that people used to have? That had some value because kids who were able to sit down at a table and eat with others, they don't have as many issues in school. They perform better academically. Their behavior is better. You know, that the sociologists came back with that. And we're, you know, busy running through the drive through, proud that we're the nation of dashboard diners. You know, that's our food culture. I actually heard, you know, in maybe this was 20 years ago when the Somali population was first starting to, you know, come into Marshall and we we're figuring out, well, how do we, you know, blend cultures? Two people that I was sitting with, with a, in a small group with a Somali man said, well, you know, if they don't know how to go through the drive through, we can help with that. <laughs> True story, yes. 
So instead of uh, thinking of, oh my goodness, the, you know, indigenous diets, wherever they are around the world, wherever people came from, that's good nutrition because it goes and is connected to the land. So if you ever want a guidepost, try to go back to indigenous ways wherever you are. That's what we're doing at, at Morris, is trying to honor those traditions and use food as a connection point to show us how you cook, show us, show us your favorite dishes. It is a win, win, win delicious situation because you can, you can taste culture, you can you know, understand people when you're sharing uh, a table with them. So I'm hoping that as we look toward um, this third people, because I do think the way that we're farming, you know, not everybody can be big, and we can't stand the attrition anymore, you know? 1% of us producing food is way too low. 1% participating in getting food to our table is way too low. We really have to find avenues and pathways and support for a next generation of people on the land because I think that is the only way that we are going to get to some of our dire health issues that we're dealing with. I am not proud of the fact that since I've been a dietitian, which is now almost 40 years, the rate of obesity and overweight has doubled. So I should really stop what I'm doing, and my profession should stop whatever it's doing, and that's administering programs one on one on one. Yeah, who cares about how awful the food supply is? You need to swim in this lane, and you're going to be healthy. You know that individual form of, of wellness. We know that doesn't work uh, here in Minnesota. There's some really interesting sort of endeavors uh, called policy systems and environmental change. So that's that we all work together to be a healthier community by changing where food comes from, connecting where that food comes from. And I know that all of you are very active or at least thinking about being active in, in making that happen. And Blue Cross Blue Shield, when they funded Morris Healthy Eating, the project that first brought me to the University of Minnesota, I couldn't fathom working with Blue Cross Blue Shield because I had been kind of fighting with them through my whole um, medical, clinical aspect of dietetics. They would not reimburse for nutrition services. It is not important. And so when Blue Cross Blue Shield first funded this saying, oh, what we're doing isn't working, I was very suspect because I really wanted to address where food came from and how it was raised. And I didn't think Blue Cross Blue Shield would ever do that. Well, lo and behold, they did care about that and were some of the earliest players to say, um, we need to change our food environment. Now, why were they doing that? Out of the goodness of their heart? No, they're looking at their actuarial tables <laughs> and saying, we are not going to be able to afford health care down the road unless we deal with nutrition-related diseases. And I have never, ever imagined that we would get to this place of so many nutrition-related diseases. When we're talking about autoimmune diseases, we you know, are centering our attention now on the 70% of our immune system that is in our intestine, in our gut. And... Um, starting to relate that to the soil microbiome, which is really, really interesting. So that Moses conference, there was one other aha moment there that I want to share with you, and that's that in my nutrition classes, you know, we had these like visual representations of what happens in the intestine, you know, when food comes in and how it's transported into the rest of the body and these nutrients are packaged and go out and are um, through the digestive system. And Elaine Ingram at the Moses Conference put up a slide of plant uptake, the roots, taking up those nutrients into the roots. And that's when I had my aha moment that we are related. We are related to the earth, we're related to the plants, we're related to other living things. I am so happy that so many of you in this room know that. And happy that if we are to think about a third people of this place, that will, it will include all of us and more. It will include a diversified farming 
that is human scale, that involves humans, that is relational, that involves uh, cooking, preparation, sharing, that we get on top of this uh, food insecurity that is creeping down the upper Minnesota River Valley. We have to stop that food desert and have it recede. The only way we can do that is make food deserts bloom, do that together, figure out what part we can do in the food system. Maybe it's to uh, volunteer driving for CSA. Maybe it's to construct a, a little guide about where you can get local food in your area. Maybe your skills are in connecting with other areas, or maybe you even want to do uh, policy. You know, we, want it, we, need, we need all of those things. We need people to bring food to the forefront, as you have here for your 12th annual conference. Now, next year, you'll be 13. <laughs> it's kind of a rebellious year, isn't it? <laughs> so I like to imagine a prairie fire kind of coming out of the Mankato area. We're ready to link up with you. Uh, we need to also pay close attention to what is happening with First Nations people as they regain their food sovereignty because they are people who naturally connect up the land and all living things and connect that with food. So if we link arms, have them in the lead, there's a wonderful conference that happens each year at Shakopee. And uh, what is happening in tribal communities is truly where I think we need to take our cues as we strive to be people in this place, responsible people who care for our neighbors, who are inclusive, and who make sure that we feed and nourish each other well. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo, for that eye-opening talk. Um, I found myself feeling the gamut of emotions for the last hour. I, I felt scared, I felt shocked, I felt angry, <laughs> everything. But I think your overall message is hope, and I really felt that. And I think you've given us a clear path to the work that I need to do to move forward. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are now uh, moving into our reflective activity. Um, in the buzz of everyday life, we often forget what a gift eating is. In addition to the biological wonder that occurs when we eat and digest food, we are also participating in something much greater. We invite you to join us in a reflective activity adapted from Nancy Bardak's Mindful Raisin exercise that demonstrates this awesome connection. Um, on your table arrangement, there are apples donated by Welsh Heritage Farms. All right, we're gonna invite you to pick up an apple, each of you. Hold your apple in your hand and look closely at it. 